That'd be great. <laughs> the broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. <laughs> Good afternoon. Thank you all for joining in this webinar on the important topic of gentrification. Um, my name is Nancy Rocket Eldridge, and I'm executive director of the National Center for Healthy Housing. And our goal as a nonprofit is to reduce health disparities in low-income communities and communities of color by reducing hazards in the home that can cause poor health. And we I uh, have just uh, recently, uh, a couple days ago, announced our Find It, Fix It, and Fund It action drive to eliminate lead in our homes and water. Um, we are also developing various financing methods with Medicaid and other sources to um, fund interventions in the home setting and have just begun to focus on housing as a platform for community health systems change. So welcome to the webinar. I want to thank the Kresge Foundation and specifically David Fukuzawa for his support and funding of this webinar series and funding the Healthy Housing, Health and Housing Funders Forum. Um, before I introduce our terrific speakers today, I want to briefly set the stage by describing the first two webinars in our three-part series on gentrification and displacement. The first segment focused on understanding how affordability impacts health, and we had terrific speakers whose takeaway messages were included health starts at home, um, housing insecurity is an indicator of likely food insecurity, and basically, in other words, housing is a key health intervention. The second segment focused on the power balance in this country as a root cause for unfettered investment in communities without sustainable protections for low-income residents. The takeaway message there was we must fund grassroots power building. Today our speakers are going to focus on how we can predict which communities might be subject to displacement due to gentrification and the levers and tools that could be put in place so that those communities can welcome investment and protect low-income residents from displacement. After the three presentations from Lisa Bates, Eli Moore and Sunita Duano Powell. We want to take the opportunity to hear from you as funders. And so David Fukuzawa from Kresge will make some comments and then open it up to hear from you um, in response to questions like, how can we get ahead of the market pressures in communities that will face displacement in the future? And how can we turn this educational effort into actual action? Um, I want to thank today's speakers for their help in shaping the content of this webinar, um, especially Maris Ash and Allison Alby from Change Lab Solutions and Yana Kachoris and MacArthur Foundation, who, in addition to the, the speakers today, um, provide us with significant help in shaping the content of today's presentation. Um, after each speaker, I will open it up to comments and questions. Some of you have audio um, permission so you can you know who you are and you can speak right up. Others um, um, are on the webinar without audio and you can text in questions or comments. So let's get started. Um, first, it is my great pleasure to introduce Lisa Bates. Lisa is a professor of urban studies and planning at Portland State University in Oregon. Her work analyzes affordable housing locations with respect to transit and jobs understanding gentrification and displacement, and how planning systems can support housing choices. Lisa, thank you for sharing your powerful work with us today, and take it away. Thank you so much. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about where we started in Portland and thinking about the gentrification problem. I'm going to show you some of the data mapping tools um, that we've been able to create. and. Um, then talk a little bit about some of our challenges and some promising approaches that we've come to today. You can advance that slide. In, back in 2012, the 
um, City of Portland created a strategic plan, the Portland plan, that was really focused around the notion of equity and racial justice. And the community that had been experiencing displacement um, at that time, really led by the African American community, demanded that the city address gentrification as a, as a key question of equity. Um, and I worked with the city um, to talk about how can we build a language and understanding for city policymakers and planners um, of what gentrification is and what is a productive way to think about it. Um, how can we map and anticipate change and then to create a strategy to recognize tools that would be aimed at different stages. Um, we can go forward. Here we go. Um, so really, we wanted to take a really pragmatic approach to thinking about gentrification, not get caught up in debating sort of the, the various pros and cons of the outcomes of neighborhood revitalization, but to recognize that when um, how, uh, mo our most vulnerable households are displaced, have, are moving involuntarily, that that is the fundamental characteristic that we're concerned about, the kind of individual, family, and community instability and harm that's caused by involuntary displacement, and particularly as people are moving away from the neighborhoods that have the highest kind of opportunity um, that we have in our city. Right, and we wanted to really focus on a role of public investment um, and focus on the predictability of gentrification, that we could see that there are neighborhoods in the city that have attractive qualities but where housing is low value, that we know we have an in-migration in the city of Portland of households that have an interest in living in what we call close-in neighborhoods that are near the central city, and they have the financial means to do so. On the other hand, those neighborhoods have long been home for communities of color who were who were really profoundly segregated, um, and in er neighborhoods that were areas of very low investment. So as the city, metro, the county, et cetera, have tried to create public investments in transit and economic development in those areas, um, we should see that as a, a potential area for gentrification. So we tried to create a really sort of simple typology to be able to look at places where gentrification is happening or will be happening um, based on this, this notion. So we first looked at mapping the housing market. Where is the housing market hot, essentially? So you can see here on this map um, Portland, primarily on the east side of the river in Portland, um, some very hot housing markets where we have high levels of appreciation um, relative to the city as a whole. Those would be the places that started out pretty low value and are moving to high value. We combine that with our notion of people who are most vulnerable to displacement. So renters, communities of color, immigrant communities, those with low educational attainment and low income. Um, and you can see here that already as of 2010, there was a pretty pretty good mismatch between where um, those communities live and where the housing market is most hot. But in our inner neighborhoods, those dark red areas close to the river, there's still significant groups of lower income communities and communities of color who are renters um, in hot areas. In sort of bringing these two pieces together is where we created um, the typology to look at places with high levels of vulnerable populations, um, su substantial demographic change, so in other words, places where those groups are moving out and then have hot housing markets or housing markets that are heating up, um, that are accelerating. And so we built this typology to look at different sort of levels or stages of gentrification from places that appear to be susceptible or in very early nascent stages of potential gentrification and displacement, those that are really the pink areas really in the, in the midst of very high population churn and housing market activity, um, and then our dark blue areas, which are areas of high opportunity but where we are continuing to lose affordable housing. Um, a couple of insights that I want to lift up from this work. One, you can see here the, the shaded area in our outer East Portland is our most um, concentrated areas of people who are vulnerable to displacement. 
um, high poverty areas. And there is a link between our gentrifying neighborhoods and our concentrated poverty neighborhoods in which people who are displaced from inner Portland move to outer Portland, um, deepening that concentration of poverty. Um, the second insight that we've had um, in the intervening um, few years since the study came out is that we had to track the housing market really continuously to capture um, our hot market areas and so we've been looking at more of our sort of market data sources to make sure that we don't miss um, the neighborhoods that are popping um, and some of those have happened where you see yellow now have actually because of some transit planned transit investments are getting hotter um, than we might have expected given where they were just a couple of years ago. Um, but recognizing that the market does respond to public investment and public investment planning um, they, and, and sort of that the city needs to take on board the responsibility to prevent and mitigate. Using this typology, we created um, a strategy that would sort of match the kind of policies to the stage of gentrification from our strongest opportunities for developing plans that include equity, participation, and housing affordability through to our late stage gentrification where we really need to um, place dollars to create more housing in those high opportunity areas. So the idea was to use these tools, norm to the stage of gentrification, paying especially close attention when the either the development regulatory environment was changing or when there was a significant public investment, um, and using tools like community impacts assessments and community benefits agreements um, and trying to incentivize inclusionary housing. Now, up until this year, 2016, um, cities in Oregon have been preempted from the use of mandatory inclusionary zoning and um, those policies cannot go into effect until November of this year. So we knew we were down um, one of the best tools for leveraging a strong market to get affordable housing. So it was, it was, it was gonna be necessary to think about other ways to try to create inclusionary housing. So this um, report, which is linked, um, you can use that link to, to get the report at the City of Portland's website and see all of the maps and methodology. Um, it didn't go very far at the time, um, a couple of years ago. I think there was still some sense that the housing market wasn't coming back. Um, and, of course, we know now that that's not really the case. Um, as our market has rebounded, um, Portland is one of the fastest growing housing prices in the country on both rental and home ownership side. Um, there were a a couple of announcements of significant investments into gentrifying neighborhoods. Um, that community was protesting quite extensively um, because it did not come along with these anti-displacement measures. Um, and now, as we have seen kind of housing crisis and in inequity in our housing market um, and the rise of homelessness spreading throughout the city, um, there's a new and more robust attention being paid to how we can move forward on some of these policy attentions. Uh, so I wanna, you know, sort of moving these intentions into action, say a couple of things about some of the new ideas that are emerging. Um, one is to recognize that um, what we're really worried about is anti-displacement. And that lens links neighborhoods and their concerns across all types, whether they are neighborhoods that are gentrifying or not gentrifying, that we needed to come up with um, an anti-displacement platform for housing stability for all low-income people. Um, again, here we're really hamstrung by our state law, which is uh, preempts both rent control and just cause eviction. Um, and so there's a lot of attention, organizing, and advocacy around figuring out both what cities can do on their own and what state changes will be needed to create a just cause eviction standard that would be meaningful for families um, across all neighborhood types. Um, again, this has specific meaning, I believe, in gentrifying neighborhoods in order to preserve um, that housing in high opportunity areas and avoid um, deepening our segregation by income and race. Um, secondly, there is a significant effort by the city of Portland to recognize past harms of urban renewal and overlapping harms from multiple um, 
economic development and transit investments, and that the African American community in Northeast Portland has experienced the greatest impacts um, of those harms over multiple generations. There is are new resources and new approaches to housing and community development um, going into Northeast Portland. The key element is the Portland Housing Bureau's what they call the preference policy. Um, it's popularly thought of as a right to return policy, but it's also a right to stay. So for new home ownership and rental opportunities subsidized by the city, um, those who have a family history living in the neighborhood themselves and parents and grandparents get top priority um, for moving into those units. Um, and you can see here what the policy sort of looks like. There's a mapping tool online that people can go and find out how many points they get in this preference policy. Um, preliminarily, about 400 people have applied for down payment assistance uh, to move into the area or purchase a home in the area. Um, and about half of those have a four to six points on a six point scale, meaning that they have, are either at risk of displacement from or have already been displaced from Northeast Portland and have deep family roots there. So the um, kind of affirmative marketing strategies and outreach strategies to work with um, African American oriented community based organizations have really captured um, the, those folks. So I think this is an important um, moment for the city to recognize that we can preserve and restore our community. Um, even though people, many people have already left Northeast Portland, that we can create a program um, to have community returned um, there. And again, if we look at the overlap of the preference policy mapping of urban renewal zones with our high opportunity, the dark purple, there's quite a bit of overlap. So we're advancing folks moving into areas with significant uh, public infrastructures and amenities um, as part of the Affirmatively Furthering Fair Housing Plan for Portland. Finally, um, there has been a tremendous community action and community collaboration with the city to ensure that anti-displacement and anti-gentrification has been baked in to land use and development regulations for all future um, ongoing development, um, particularly as public infrastructures are, are extended. So our comprehensive land use plan and development regulations will now embed community benefits and um, development extractions to ensure that affordable housing is linked together um, with new development. Again, this is coordinated with our fair housing programs, and I think it's really important that we've started to recognize community preservation doesn't just mean um, historic buildings or trees, but also means cultural um, and socioeconomic diversity and stability for um, communities, particularly those that have been marginalized and underserved in the past. There's a really significant coalition of anti-displacement community groups um, working on this effort and have been um, su very successful with our comprehensive land use plan and now in the development of our mandatory inclusionary zoning policy newly enabled by the state um, with developers and social justice activists kind of working together um, to figure out how can we ensure that we have an inclusionary zoning policy that includes um, a neighborhood lens on where people um, can live to have the greatest opportunity. And as we look ahead, we're seeing both bus rapid transit and light rail extension um, to try to embed community benefits there and then really trying to scale the anti-displacement work across all neighborhoods in Portland, recognizing that at least here there's not really any ungentrifiable areas um, and that we need to sort of embed and platform uh, anti-displacement everywhere. So um, again, just trying to give a sense of how we've tried to translate data and this abstract strategy into action, recognizing displacement um, and housing stability as a link across multiple policy areas, restoring community um, to actually mitigate gentrification, not just prevent, but try to reverse some of the effects, and then for our future development, making sure that we uh, bake in that anti-displacement lens to all of our um, planned um, development going into the future. Um, yes, thank you, Lisa. Um, that was really a terrific, terrific presentation. What really struck me, and I think so many of us have worked on these issues for decades, is is your message of 
of continuously tracking the housing market uh, and baking it in so that uh, so many strategies we have all tried, um, when they're not baked in, uh, they, they, they fall away. And, and then we're, um, we're left at, you know, at, at our point of beginning. So thank you so much for your um, incredible work, Lisa. And I want to open it up to um, questions, um, comments from the listeners. Um, those who, who have a live audio feed, just please state your name and, um, and state your question or comment. And do we have any text questions? No. Lisa, one question I have for you sure. is um, your reference to data mapping tools. Um, are those tools readily available to any community? <laughs> Um, sure, yes. Um, we, one of the goals um, in the mapping was to try to use only publicly available free data um, that could be sort of simplified so that it was a fairly robust approach to, that matched on to like our understanding of what's happening with people in the housing market, um, but that wasn't super complicated. Um, so all of the, the data and those methods are all in free publicly available data. Um, and then right now we're looking at, I'm looking with my team at which of the kind of online, you know, Zillow, Redfin, you know, just real basic looks at housing market changes could we use that seem reasonably accurate to, to continuously kind of pop up those hot spots. Great. And we have a, a question for you, Lisa, from Timothy McHugh. And the question is, can you describe what's been happening in the suburbs as the gentrification has been occurring in the city? Sure. Um, well, in our um, close-in suburbs on the east side, there is um, quite a bit of movement from people who have been displaced from the city of Portland into those areas that are a little bit lower cost. And there's actually a tremendous concern there um, because, of course, the infrastructure, I mean, the physical infrastructure is, you know, doesn't serve a transit-dependent person very well, um, doesn't serve a person who has been connected to specific community and cultural institutions that remain in the inner part of Portland very well. Um, there's And there's been some, I think it's fair to say, conflict in our school systems as groups that have not previously um, gone to school in those areas are, are now kids are there and are looking for a more culturally responsive teaching, are facing discipline disparities um, around race and immigration sort of ethnicity culture, I would say. Um, and that's, that's kind of our east side. Um, and then to the north, which is another place that people move across the state line into Washington, they have extreme housing pressures. In fact, Vancouver, Washington, um, just on the other side of the river, has as significant of a rental housing crisis as Portland and an eviction crisis as Portland, in part because of these, these pressures as people are seeking housing outside of the central city of Portland. Hi, uh, this is Susan Lampley. Uh, from Melville Charitable Trust. Uh, this, I think this is terrific and, and really an example of, of, of some of the things that we all hope will come as a result of the AFFH rule and, and that uh, planning. And I, I know that this doesn't happen overnight and I was wondering if you could talk a little bit more about your advocacy efforts and efforts to get your um, local policymakers and municipalities on board, like the mayor's office or uh, county supervisors, however your um, local governments are, and, and just talking about how, because things like preferences and um, mandatory inclusionary zoning, um, that, you know, that takes some coordination mm -hmm. at the municipal level. And so can you talk a little bit about how you were able to bring those entities along. 
Yeah, absolutely. So um, as I mentioned, this, this original equity plan um, was adopted in 2012, and that was after about three years of ongoing process. Um, Portland, as many of you probably realize, is, is one of the whitest cities in America. And I would say after, after the 2010 census um, came out sort of reconfirming that and also confirming quite a bit of the displacement that communities of color had seen, there was a real effort by a group called the Coalition of Communities of Color, which is an umbrella organization of CBOs, to bring forward um, what they call the unsettling profile to talk about racial disparities. And that really captured the attention, I think, of a lot of our policymakers. You know, we're a good progressive city and we want to be seen that way, certainly, that drove that equity plan. Um, and there's just been a lot of continued organizing by those communities. So there is a, another community coalition, ADPDX, the Anti-Displacement Portland Coalition, that has included um, both the, the groups that, work at the, that worked at the state level to try to repeal the inclusionary zoning ban, are now working at the state level to try to repeal the ban on rent control and the ban on just cause eviction. And that's difficult because it's hard, I think, for, you know, city, neighborhood, community-based organizations to scale up to that state-level advocacy. That's been a tough nut to crack. But they have been partnering with groups like 1,000 Friends of Oregon, which is a statewide land use organization, um, which helps to supply some of the really technical assistance on, you know, what are what is legal in our land use law system to create, you know, requirements for, um, you know, affordable housing or community benefits with upzoning. These are not, this isn't an arena that a lot of social justice advocates and even housing advocates have played in, but I think as the AFFH rules um, can be applied in these planning systems, having that partnership um, with the sort of technical land use planning experts, certainly from our, um, our school here at Portland State in the, in the planning department, we've been trying to also supply t technical assistance there, interns, et cetera, to try to translate planning to human, um, and then back again to bring those values into that, into that system. But it has been a, a long ramp up that I think was greatly accelerated in the past year by the depth of the housing crisis and what we've seen in terms of um, evictions and homelessness. Great, thanks Lisa. We have one last question um, from Amy Kenyon at Ford Foundation. Um, and Amy writes, I'm very interested in the policy about prioritizing a right to return. Is that happening as part of the city's assessment of fair housing or is it a recommendation of the community and advocacy group? Um, that is a policy that is happening now. It is being used currently to prioritize um, the distribution of housing resources in the urban renewal area in North and Northeast Portland. Um, so it's basically housing programs that are touched by urban renewal dollars um, have that policy applied to it. Um, and again, if you, if you go click to the link, you can actually go directly to the application and applicants put in their address. They put in an address that parents or grandparents lived in and it tells them how many points they have. They can also do it at the library. They can do it with community-based organizations um, or with the housing service providers themselves. Um, and that will rank them into the system for um, accessing down payment assistance or new rental assistance. Great. Thanks, Lisa. Um, I, I know others have questions, and at the very end, David is going to guide us in a discussion and dialogue, and so I, I hope um, everyone who has questions can hang on to those, and um, we can um, have further conversation. Um, but next, I want to say how fortunate we are to have Eli Moore here from the Haas Institute at Berkeley, where he is the California Community Partnership Program Manager. Um, Eli's research focuses on race public policy and social movement strategy. Welcome, Eli. Um, thanks so much for being here and sharing your thoughts and um, helping us to recognize and uh, address um, displacement. Take it away, Thank Eli. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Good to be here. A uh, little bit about the Haas Institute. We were established in 2010 at UC Berkeley under the leadership of John Powell. And 
Our work is to bring together researchers, organizers, stakeholders, communicators, and policymakers to identify and eliminate the barriers to an inclusive, just, and sustainable society. Um, no small task. Um, gentrification and displacement relate to a few different areas of our work. We have community partnerships with grassroots organizations in neighborhoods facing displacement. Um, we do policy and technical assistance. Um, right now with uh, in particular on California state housing plan and then we also do a bunch of demographic and spatial analysis um, and then just conceptual work analytical work um, trying to develop it, uh, frameworks for understanding these issues so I'd like to do a couple things first I wanted to introduce belonging and othering as as a lens for thinking about gentrification and displacement um, then I'm going to talk about Richmond, California situation as a case study and a way to highlight the, the structural forces leading to displacement. And then turn toward solutions and discuss some of the opportunities and limits for action at the local level. Um, and then lastly, I want to talk about what we believe are two major keys to change. One, one is about scale, the other is about strategic narrative. And the point about scale is that there are important limits at the local level and state and national action is really needed. The point about strategic narrative is that we, we really have to dedicate ourselves to creating a coherent vision of society that underpins this work and moves us beyond the current dominant narrative of ineffective government, individual rights, and corporate markets. So, this idea of moving from othering to belonging, um, when we say belonging, we're talking about who is inside um, the circle of human concern, who is valued. And so when you look a lot across institutions and, and culture and society, um, you can see that many groups are, are othered, are pushed outside of this circle of human concern. Um, and Gentrification and displacement are very much about a question of who belongs. Um, geographically, who belongs, who gets to stay, who gets to feel at home in their community. Uh, but like, so, so as we move towards belonging, we're at this broad frame, we're trying to create a society where everyone belongs. But like other questions of belonging, displacement is a structural phenomenon. It's it's not determined by a single institution or industry and doesn't rely on intentional actions for it to persist, which is why it's, it's so challenging. So turning towards Richmond as a way to kind of look into this, um, Richmond's a inner ring working class suburb of about 100,000 people just 15 miles from San Francisco. Um, during World War II, its population grew fivefold, um, mostly driven by African-American families migrating to the shipyards to build ships for World War II. Um, since then, the, the, the shipyards shut down, um, residential sh segregation and um, job discrimination prevented people from, from following those jobs. So deindustrialization, concentrated poverty, mass incarceration ensued. Um, now it's still a majority Latino and African-American and low-income city but it's seen a wave of commercial and residential development, including the development of a new research campus by UC Berkeley. But Richmond's also known for um, a whole series of remarkable progressive victories. Uh, these are just some of the headlines about recent policies, including what was the state's highest minimum wage, the most progressive version of a ban the box policy, um, one of the first city general plans to have a health element and a climate and energy element. It's also one of the 14 sites of the California Endowment's Building Healthy Com Communities Initiative. So in some respects, Richmond is as far as, as any city has gone in, in extending progressive policy at the local level. And, and you can see real impact, um, for instance, on, on issues like gun violence. In 2013, the city recorded 16 homicides, the lowest number it had seen in, in 33 years, and its lowest homicide rate in the city's recorded history. 
just one example of the of the impact. Um, meanwhile, we see clear patterns of early gentrification and displacement. Uh, the African American population in Richmond fell by 12,500 people between 2000 and 2013, while Latinos, Asian Americans increased and the white population remained stable. So we recently used Professor Bates' methodology to measure gentrification in the city and found that it's in the early and middle stages in some areas across the center and the north of the city, which you can see on the map are the orange and, and red areas. And I would just say that, that, um, that Lisa's methodology is really useful, has, been a, um, has really changed the conversation in Richmond. Um, and, and was pretty straightforward to, to adapt to the local context. So this is part of a um, pretty widely recognized now regional phenomenon of, of displacement where historic African American Latino communities are being reconfigured and families are being pushed out to the periphery of the region. Um, this is a graph of the African American population in San Francisco compared with San Joaquin County, which is outside of the Bay Area to the east. It's about 75 miles from San Francisco. And you can see that San Joaquin's black population starts under 20,000 in 1970 compared to 100,000 in San Francisco, but San Joaquin then passes San Francisco in 2010, which San, San Joaquin is, has nowhere near the, the job density, the the transit access, the um, service infrastructure, the cultural institutions that, that San Francisco and other areas where people are being displaced from have. So there's a clear affordability crisis. Um, rents are up and wages are down. Um, for in the, the four-year period from 2011 to 2015, rent in Richmond rose 26%. Um, while wages rose just just five percent. Regionally, rents have been climbing dr dramatically, pushing people out of higher priced areas and into Richmond. So there's kind of a uh, a, r a ripple effect um, from the core to the periphery. And the outcome in Richmond is, is overburdened renters. Thirty seven percent of the renters earn less than thirty five thousand annually and spend more of their um, more than 30% of their income on housing. And African Americans and Latinos are squeezed hardest because they, in part, because they disproportionately make up low-income renter households in the city. Among Asian and white householders, the, the percentage of, of renting households is 29% and 30%, but among African American and Latino householders, it's twice that, 60% of, of households are, are renting their home. And, and renter-occupied households are disproportionately families with, with, minors, with minor children. Um, they also have noticeably lower wages. So African-American and Latino households in the, in the East Bay have median incomes that are about half and two-thirds, respectively, of, of white households' median income. And this gap has actually widened since the year 2000. The result is a housing market that works best for investors. Um, so many of the new homes purchased in the city have been bought by absentee owners investing in property, thereby increasing the percentage of residents who are renting and pushing up prices. The percentage of homes bought by absentee owner owners was under 15% in 2006 and 7, but rose to over 40% in 2011 and 12. And the same trend is true when it comes to cash purchases. So this brings us to what I think is the fundamental question, can we improve community health and well-being in a place without displacing the people who most need it? Um, many people in Richmond fear that the improvements to community health won't be enjo enjoyed by the people who stuck around and, and turned their city around and actually brought about those improvements. So um, I, I kind of um, 
basic typology of, of solutions. There's no silver bullet. We need a comprehensive approach that cuts across housing and economic opportunity. Um, under, uh, in the sphere of housing, we need to limit speculative investment. For instance, policies like purchasing rental housing to make it permanently affordable, limiting condo conversions, requiring seismic retrofits on purchased homes. Um, we need to produce adequate affordable housing, policies like linkage fees and occlusionary zoning. We need to protect tenants and stabilize rents through policies like rent control and just cause for eviction. And we need to ensure healthy and habitable housing through things like proactive code enforcement and tenant services. But then we also need to think about the, the economic opportunity side with equitable development strategies like community benefits agreements, responsible contracting, targeted hire policies, linked learning, um, social wages, um, things like subsidized daycare, and then targeting policies to reverse what are really these persistent racialized outcomes by using geography or demographics or um, repairing past wrongs related to past policies. But but with each of these, there, there are really limits on what local government and communities can achieve. For instance, the state of California limits rent control ordinances so that 40, in Richmond, 40% 40 of renter households in Richmond are ineligible for rent control because their building was built after 1994 or is a single unit building. And the city last year passed, became the first city to pass a rent control policy. It was then pulled back by a um, signature gathering effort uh, by the Apartment Owners Association, and now it's going on the ballot. Um, another state policy limit on rent control is that there's vacancy decontrol. So anytime somebody leaves their unit, if it's covered by rent control, um, anytime they leave, the rent bumps up to market rate. So you're constantly losing affordable units as people move. And then also a lack of funding and commitment to develop new affordable housing at the state level. So the Bay Area, um, through the Regional Housing Needs Assessment, uh, came up with how many units they would need to produce from 2007 to 2014. Um, the region then produced only 28% of the very low, low and moderate income housing that it knew it needed. Um, so the state law requires a housing needs assessment, but doesn't require that you meet the goals based on that assessment. State funding for affordable housing is virtually non-existent. And, and then you have the, the wealthier areas using zoning and CEQA to prevent affordable housing in their neighborhoods. So, I think real solutions do require state policy change. The um, one that, that we look to is the fair share policy in, in New Jersey, which would require each jurisdiction to provide its fair share of its region's need for low and moderate income housing. Um, another policy is to provide sufficient funding for regions to meet their affordable housing goals. The, um, the state, California's legislative Analysts predicts that California will need 100,000 units annually in addition to all the units that um, the current trends would, would lead to. So somehow we need to um, find a way to develop, provide 100,000 more units per year. And then remove vacancy decontrol from rent control policies so that we can preserve the affordability of a, a major stock of housing. And lastly, to allow rent control to apply to single-family homes and buildings built any year. But um, any of these policies quickly come up against powerful interests and even more powerful ideology. So pol policies like fair share housing development, rent control, just cause, are quickly labeled as government overreach. Um, a common response is that landlords have rights to their property that shouldn't be infringed upon. Another is that the market is always the best way to distribute resources, so it should be left alone to course correct. 
Um, and then other responses reflect coded racial messages such as that affordable units will bring down property values or change the character of the neighborhood. So these responses reflect a, a dominant narrative that, that we're all very familiar with and was intentionally developed and, and maintained over the last 40 years. And it boils down to a story that government is a tool used by undeserving, particularly people of color, to take from people who deserve what they have. And therefore, small government, individual rights, and a deregulated market are ideal for society. And we really believe that we need to engage in the work of developing a, a new dominant narrative, developing a strategic narrative that furthers belonging. And it has to speak to who we are, not just our interests or even values. And it has to have a clear vision for government and other social institutions, how the, what their purpose is, what their structure is. Um, and it has to be tried and refined and advanced um, and fought, fought for as something that is as important as particular policies or, or programs that we advocate for. So I'll end there, and um, hopefully this was um, something that was helpful. Thanks for, thanks for having me. Thank you, Eli. That was, that was excellent. Um, so something you said in, in your outline um, for this presentation really struck me. You, you, you said individual rights are supreme, um, and, and I think you were referring to the rights of, of, of property owners. Um, and you really pointed out what I think is a root problem, which is that um, uh, landlords do uh, have individual rights and are and those rights are protected, but individual tenants or residents um, are not viewed as individuals. They're indi they're viewed as a group to be controlled or um, contained and. Um, I think I think uh, you really put your finger on the a root a root cause of the the problems we face today. Um, I'd like to open it up for just a couple minutes to comments and questions um, about the presentation, um, and then we're going to turn it to um, Sunita to um, questions and effective interventions. Um, so let's see who do we have who who would like to comment was a question to those of you who have open mic and I don't know if the question you had on tap earlier was is still appropriate Like you're you're muted. So, um, okay. I well, think I'm un, I think I'm unmuted. Oh, great. Thanks, Sandy. Welcome. Thank you. Um, I wanted to ask, and that was a really interesting presentation and very different from the uh, Portland scenario. And I wanted to ask what uh, role the philanthropic community played. Um, in Richmond or the East Bay area. You know, I know that in Portland it makes a huge difference. Um, where, where is their um, advocacy or do they support some of these um, community groups who are working on these issues? Um, are they partnering um, with the city to try, in ways to try to get around some of the state limitations? Sort of where is the funding community? Thanks, Sandy. Yeah. The, the major initiative in the city is the Endowments Building Healthy Communities Initiative, which started about five years ago and funds a broad range of work on the social determinants of health and has really, um, really been a huge boost for a lot of the community organizing groups. Um, who build power in the um, marginalized neighborhoods. So um, 
I think that has been a pretty transformative role for, for philanthropy. There, there are also a number of, of smaller foundations that, um, that also support organizing work. I think, I think that my sense is that the, the health-related funders are um, a little new and, and still kind of testing the waters when it comes to displacement and, um, and gentrification, partly because they, they aren't sure if it's just a housing issue and they don't see themselves as housing funders. Um, so it sounds like this, this webinar series is really speaking to that, but I think there's a growing recognition that, um, that when you have a place-based initiative that doesn't factor in gentrification and displacement, um, you're at risk of contributing to or, um, or, or ignoring um, gentrification and then the communities who you most want to benefit or who you want to benefit from the place-based initiative actually get displaced and um, aren't able to, to, to live with the, the benefits of that work. Great. Thank you, Eli. A great presentation. Um, I want to turn it to Sunita. Um, Sunita Duano Powell is a senior planner at Change Lab Solutions in Oakland, California. Um, she has been a huge help in organizing today's speakers. Thank you very much for that. Um, she works on issues at the intersection of health and housing. Uh, Sunita has her law degree and her master's of city planning from the University of California, Berkeley. Welcome, Sunita. Thank you. Um, and I think Eli's final comments are a perfect segue. Um, so as Nancy mentioned, my name is Sunita Devono Powell. I'm a senior planner at Change Lab Solutions. And um, Change Lab Solutions is a public health nonprofit based in Oakland that works nationally to improve health outcomes for communities and has gotten more um, involved and active in issues around displacement and access to affordable housing for exactly some of the reasons that have been highlighted. This is a really big topic with a lot of nuance, so I want to start my presentation by providing a quick overview of some of the national housing trends. And then I'm going to talk about some key interventions and their capacity to mitigate the effects of gentrification. Uh, while my focus is going to be on local interventions, I want to spend a little bit of time um, looking at the interplay between local, state, and federal action. And I'll conclude with some themes that should be considered when thinking about future policy interventions. So to begin, we know that housing costs are rising while wages are stagnating or declining across the country. Uh, this means that people are paying too much for their housing. Um, this is particularly true for renters, who are a growing portion of our population. Renters, the groups that are disproportionately impacted by being cost burdened are communities of color and seniors. And our country is in the process of becoming both more diverse and seeing a huge boom in its senior population. So it's not surprising that studies indicate that the number of people who are paying more than they can afford on rent is going to rise making more people vulnerable to high housing costs and the risk of displacement. Unfortunately, federal housing policy continues to operate in a way that does not reflect the current population or its housing needs. Um, I don't have time to get into the history of redlining, and I think Maris talked about it in her presentation. Um, but I want to point out that federal housing policies have and continue to drive housing production with stark and troubling impacts for specific communities. So even though redlining may no longer be practiced, federal policies continue to privilege single-family home ownership, as shown here, with a disproportionate of the home ownership benefits going to high-income households. These policies influence production, as I mentioned, which is why, despite an enormous need for affordable and multifamily housing across the nation, a recent study showed that 82% of rental housing built in 54 metropolitan areas in the last few years was for luxury markets. At the same time that housing production is failing to serve current populations, money targeted towards affordable housing is shrinking. 
This report um, on Alameda County came out last week, and it shows a rise in housing costs, a decline in income, and on the bottom, you'll notice that funding from 2008-2009 for affordable housing compared to the 2014 to 2015 funding. This is a result of a variety of state and federal policies, which I will give you the preview is going to be a big theme of this presentation. Um, and as you can see at the bottom, since 2000, HUD has cut its main grants to cities and states by 50%. Given all of this, um, it's not surprising that we're seeing a growth in gentrification. A recent survey of 50 of the largest states in the country found that the rates of gentrification are increasing. Equally disturbing in this study was that non-gentrifying neighborhoods are getting poorer. Um, what this paints is a picture of widening inequality in our nation. So this can feel a little overwhelming, but there are a lot of effective strategies. Some of them um, Eli and Lisa have already touched on. Um, as I go through some of these strategies, I want to note that, um, which I think Eli very eloquently stated, many of our current housing policies are a reflection of a national unwillingness to address structural inequality. And this is part of the reason that communities of color are bearing the brunt of displacement, which is also why there needs to be targeted interventions on their behalf. So what can we do? As capital and populations are moving back into urban cores, what can be done to ensure that low-income residents and residents of color are not again forced to move? How are neighborhood cities and regions addressing gentrification and displacement? Um, so I'm going to talk about a few examples of interventions. It's not a full survey, um, but I think it shows types of strategies across a spectrum of markets and um, with a variety of results. Uh, many of these interventions are in a toolkit we put out last year, and I would encourage those who are interested in learning more to check it out. There's a link on this, on this page. Before I get into the interventions, I want to tell a little story that's come out of some of our recent work around health and housing. Um, as part of a project that was funded by Kresge and MacArthur, we are working with Bon Secours Hospital in Baltimore which has been providing affordable housing for over 30 years. Um, when we first spoke to Bon Secours and asked them how they got into affordable housing, their answer was the 1986 tax reform bill. Um, the primary purpose of the 1986 tax reform bill was to lower taxes, but it also eliminated many of the tax incentives for multifamily rental properties. So within a few years of its passage, 67 of the 101 properties neighboring Bon Secours became vacant. Bon Secours had just invested in an expansion and renovation of its hospital, and the neighborhood went into a rapid decline. Um, so the hospital's response was to acquire 58 of those 67 properties and develop them into affordable housing. Today, Bon Secours manages more than 800 units for low-income senior and disabled residents. One of their um, buildings is pictured on the bottom. I love the story because it highlights the unintended consequence of policy and the importance of local institutions and creative problem solving. It's also a concrete example of how federal, state, and local policies interact. Um, so there's a lot that's being done, a lot of innovative strategies being applied at the local level, which is important because housing markets exist within a local context. We can think of many of these um, strategies as people-based or place-based. For years, advocates and academics have argued over which one is more effective, but I think in most situations, you need a combination. So in addition to talking about some people and place-based interventions, I'm also going to highlight some strategies that are a hybrid of the two. Um, <clears throat> rent stabilization, it's familiar, it's controversial, um, it limits the amount that a tenant's rent can be raised, it can preserve affordability for tenants who, where it might not otherwise exist, However, as Eli mentioned, there are often exemptions, um, and in 26 states, it's actually preempted. Um, because rent stabilization is tied to a specific tenant in a unit, when housing markets increase dramatically, there's also strong incentives to push out tenants who are benefiting from these rent controls. So San Francisco and Chinatown and the Mission sort of paint an ex uh, a good picture of, I think, the limits and potential for rent stabilization strategies. 
Um, San Francisco's had a fairly robust rent stabilization ordinance since 1979, but it's also experienced dramatic increases in housing prices recently. In Chinatown, where 92 percent of the units are rent controlled because the housing stock is old, um, the area has remained fairly stable despite intense market pressures. A report from the Center for Community Innovation suggests that this is in part due to community organizing. Community efforts put zoning controls in place that prevent large-scale developments, and they've also worked effectively to prevent evictions. The mission, on the other hand, has become a poster child for late-stage gentrification in San Francisco. Since 2000, the mission has lost almost half of its family households, a fifth of its Latino population, and more than half of its residents without a high school diploma. While two-thirds of the units in the mission are rent controlled, this area has also experienced the highest number of tenant buyouts and evictions. Eviction protection is clearly an important component of both the efficacy of rent stabilization and preventing displacement. Um, Oakland's Just Cause for Eviction Ordinance is one local law that creates eviction protections. It requires any landlord moving to evict a tenant to provide written notice listing which of the 11 just causes is the reason for eviction. However, again, eviction protections only apply in Oakland to units built before 1983, and in many places across the country, they're preempted. And again, where high profits are involved, evictions still increase. In 2015, there were over 10,000 eviction cases in Oakland, a 51% increase since 2007. So Oakland recently passed a moratorium on both rent increases and evictions as it's struggling to figure out how to prevent the current rates of displacement. One of the things the city is trying to do during the moratorium is to up the staffing available to counsel tenants on their rights. This leads us to a third strategy housing counsel or legal representation. Legal counsel supports the strategies mentioned above by ensuring they are actually enforced. Again, this is key in areas of gentrification, but the example I'm going to highlight came out of an area of deep disinvestment. In 2005, New York launched a three-year pilot program to help families avoid evictions and homelessness. The project targeted a neighborhood in the South Bronx, which had a poverty rate of 45%. The Housing Help Project, as it was known, was housed within the court and provided legal representation as well as social services. Over the time of the pilot, 1,388 families were served. In 91% of the cases, the project was able to prevent loss of housing, and in 86% of the cases, it was able to avoid an eviction judgment. While the program was expensive, costing $45,000 a year, the cumulative savings from helping families stay in their homes is estimated at more than $700,000. So as you can see, people-based strategies are crucial, but they need a lot of support, particularly in areas where gentrification is already happening. Inclusionary housing is useful in areas where gentrification is also happening. Inclusionary housing um, can be great in a lot of, a lot of contexts, um, but, and Santa Monica is a very good model because it has one of the oldest and strictest policies in the country. Um, the Santa Monica policy requires that builders provide 25% more affordable units in off-site projects and that all off-site development is within a quarter mile of current development. However, 65% um, of all inclusionary units built in the United States are located either in New Jersey or California. And I think that this highlights that, uh, the, that this strategy is particularly well suited to areas with high land values as a way to get affordable units out of building booms. And it might be less effective in areas that are not um, experiencing the same rates of housing production. For areas that are not experiencing building booms, there's still a need for housing preservation and rehabilitation. And this should be done in a way that accounts for potential future displacement. Um, local efforts to buy affordable housing before it expires, targeting resources to local home, low income homeowners to support fixing up housing stock are two examples. Targeted local rent subsidies and purchasing of housing while it's affordable are others. Um, the neighborhood of East Russell Louisville offers a great example of crafting a preservation 
rehabilitation and investment strategy in such a way that residents actually benefit. The East Russell Partnership was started in 1990 in one of the poorest communities in Louisville, a historically African-American neighborhood. The initial focus was to expand community services, support low-income homeowners, and attract moderate homeowners. Slowly, the community has seen improvements without displacement. Over the past 25 years, homeownership has grown from 31% to 65%. 500 homes have been renovated and another 180 have been built. It's worth noting that this neighborhood experienced zero foreclosures during the recession. Um, and as housing rates have increased, the racial composition of the neighborhood has remained steady. Um, so code enforcement is uh, not traditionally thought of in this context. Um, and traditional complaint-based code enforcement, which has been designed to ensure that residents' homes are safe and habitable, has often actually played a unfortunate role of exacerbating displacement, particularly for immigrants. And um, there's a very great history of this um, if people are interested in learning more about it. Um, additionally, many vulnerable residents who live in unsafe or unhealthy conditions are often reluctant to complain about housing conditions because they do not want to lose their place of residence. So proactive code enforcement programs can avoid displacement while improving living conditions, but they also can help local areas collect good data about rental housing stock and future needs. Um, so one program that's often highlighted is a program that was started in 2002 in Greensboro. Uh, because it tied compliance to rental income, um, it was extremely effective, um, whereas previous complaints were only half of previous complaints were resolved within a month. After the program was put in place, nine out of 10 complaints were resolved in the same time frame. Unfortunately, the North Carolina program was preempted by state law in 2011. Seattle program is worth mentioning um, because it's phasing in a requirement for all, all units, and there tends to be uh, a lot of exemptions, both in terms of rent control, rental enforcement, stabilization for sing, uh, single units um, as opposed to multifamily units. Um, and I think it's it's worth noting that they are imposing this on all units, um, which will mean that they will have a complete database of rental units for the city, which I think is useful for implementation of other policies in the future. Integrated services and rehabilitation. So this is a hybrid program that actually comes out of the pilot program I mentioned um, earlier. And uh, in the wake of studies about the success of that program, New York has expanded legal services. It's not that it, they continue to have these targeted um, service provision offices in areas with high risks of homelessness, but then they've expanded legal services. Um, and last year, they saw a 18% decrease in eviction rates. Most recently, the city's added what is called the Tenant Support Unit, which is a proactive project that does outreach. Um, city workers literally knock on the doors and identify tenants that are needing legal support, rental assistance, and or necessary repairs. In the case of legal support and rental assistance, they can refer them to the appropriate person. Um, in the case of repairs, the city then does the repairs and bills the landlord. Um, the tenant support unit is currently focused on areas that have been recently rezoned, and I'm sure you guys are all aware of the controversy around de Blasio's rezoning, um, where concerns about displacement are high. But I think this is a great strategy, um, type of strategy, that all areas should be engaged in when they're about to make major infrastructure investments or zoning and to ensure that um, you're not ending up having to rely on right to return policies after the fact. Um, so the tenant right first of first refusal is another uh, hybrid strategy that focuses both on place and people. The oldest program is in DC, um, and it allows tenant residents to buy their building when the owner wants to sell. Evaluations of DC's program, which has been around for 40 years, show that um, participants pay significantly lower housing costs than their neighbors, often much lower than affordable housing units. Um, however, TOPA can be, uh, TOPA is what it's called in DC, 
um, the Tenant Opportunity to Purchase Act. Uh, but the right of refusal, or TOPA, can be expensive, requires legal support and funding. So DC, which started this program 40 years ago, has only preserved 2,600 units. One of the other advantages of TOPA, or right of first refusal, is that it can delay sales for up to 13 months because there's a whole process where the, off the owner has to make an offer, the tenant has a right to respond, and then make a counteroffer. And as is seen um, with a moratorium in Oakland and the attempt to pass a moratorium in the mission, sometimes a little bit of a delay can really help ease um, market uh, pressures in a neighborhood or city. So the final local intervention I want to talk about is also very expensive in areas that are already gentrifying, but is proven to be very stable in the long run. Um, I, I think most people know about the Dudley Street Initiative. It's a well-known community land trust that was started in 1984, and it became the first community group to win power of eminent domain to acquire vacant land for resident-led development. Um, in community land trusts, people own the homes, but the trust owns the land, which uh, means that the, there are restrictions on how and to whom the owner can sell. And because of these restrictions, owners pay lower property taxes. Uh, one of the reasons I wanted to highlight um, this oldie but goodie is um, in the wake of the foreclosure crisis, community land trusts um, have proven to be the most resilient form of home ownership. Um, so in 2009, when there were 2.8 million foreclosures, 15% of all subprime loans foreclosed, 3.6% of FHA loans closed, while only 0.6 of community land trust loans foreclosed. Um, this is particularly notable given that community land trust homeowners are low income. So here we have some of the interventions, um, but as I mentioned, many of these interventions are constrained by state action. A lot of the other interventions are constrained by lack of federal funding. So this brings us to the role of the state in preventing gentrification and displacement. Aside from its negative effects through preemption of quite a few important housing policies, there are a few um, proactive strategies that states take. Um, but first, we have to acknowledge the harmful effects of state preemption in this context. As you all are probably aware of with conversations around the North Carolina bathroom bill, preemption has been an increasingly popular strategy to override progressive initiatives. While, uh, and you know, of the recommendations that I spoke about, evictions, code enforcement, rent control, inclusionary housing, these are all preempted in various states. Um, however, while we are seeing how state preemption can limit strategic housing initiatives, um, there are some ways in which states can override regressive local zoning policies to incentivize the production of affordable housing. And Eli mentioned the New Jersey Fair Housing Act, which um, gives states the right to override local regu regulations. It's called the builder's remedy because localities who fail to comply with requirements to allow for affordable housing can be sued by the developers. Um, the New Jersey example came out of a Supreme Court case that alleged suburban practices of um, local exclusionary zoning, locking black residents out of um, high opportunity areas. The other examples that are listed here were just implemented at a state level, and they all sort of um, provide interesting incentives to um, reduce or diminish some of the uh, local restrictions that have uh, negative impacts on low-income communities. The other Nina? important, yeah? It's Nancy. I just wanted to do a little time check. We've got about 15 minutes left. Um, okay. So, um, uh, could you take another minute or so? Yeah, I can totally do that. <laughs> um, okay, so I will just flag the tax allocation system is another important role of um, the state. Um, and Minnesota just put out a really interesting report on this issue. Um, unfortunately, 
tax allocation requires federal funding, and federal funding pools are shrinking. Um, so at the federal level, uh, in addition to the shrinking subsidies and housing production, the federal government also allocates incentives and works to ensure fair housing. Um, I just want to make two points on this. One is that um, there's really no such thing as a free market in terms of in the housing context. The federal government spends or offers tax incentives to the equivalent of $450 billion a year on real estate, and it spends $40 billion a year on affordable housing. So there's um, priorities that are reflected in the policies that are in place. Um, and fair housing is just something to keep our eye on. I think the recent Supreme Court case and the actions by HUD um, and Department of Justice around fair housing offer some interesting clues about um, future possibilities. So I'm just going to conclude by saying I think um, here are some key considerations for preventing displacement. We need interventions on multiple levels, uh, state, federal, and um, local actions should be supporting each other. Interventions should be tailor tailored to the specific context, both in terms of the state of gentrification risk and the need of the population. Um, I think it's key to think about place and people-based strategies. Uh, community organizing and capacity building is what sustains most efforts. Um, and then as a last note, I didn't talk about it, but small businesses play an important role and need to be um, included in anti-displacement strategies. Uh, so with that, I will open it for questions. Thank you, Sunita. That was awesome. You are a wealth of information. It's, it's amazing. Um, I, I want to, um, at this point, we have 15 minutes left. I'd like to turn it to David Fukuzawa from Kresge Foundation to um, basically manage a, a dialogue with um, those of you who are uh, uh, participating today. Um, and um, we also welcome uh, questions and comments, but I'd like to turn it to David and thank you again for your incredible support of, of this webinar series and the Health and Housing Funders Forum over the years. David? And you may be on mute. Uh, David, can you unmute yourself? Looks like you're on mute. Is a pin number needed? Does he know that? Okay. All right. Um, well, while we um, while we wait for David to um, deal with the technology. Um, we, we wanted to open up the dialogue um, with you all and, um, and, and ask you first, you know, given the incredible information you learned from today's presentation. Um, Hello. Hello. Hi, David. Welcome. Yeah, I'm sorry. I, 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 couldn't, I, couldn't, I didn't know if I was muted. I couldn't even find the button. So anyway, sorry. Oh, um, no problem. I've, I've had about a zillion technical issues at this end before getting in, but, but I, I finally got through. I would, I would say just, you know, if, if we were in a, an open audience in person, I would have just called for applause for the speakers. They were tremendous. Um, I just want to, I, we, I really want to get the discussion because we have funders on the line. And uh, I, I do want to say just a couple of things, though. Um, and, and part of this is reference to what something Eli said. Because this was our experience, you know. So everybody by now kind of knows about social determinants of health, but but if you talk to funders by and large in the health area, almost none of them would have included housing as a social determinant. And the reason we started this forum was to address that, you know. And we were looking at that point at like obvious stuff like lead and asthma and stuff like that. But we very quick, quickly realized that this was a deeply systemic issue and that substandard housing was connected to uh, displacement 
active displacement, it was, it was connected to affordability, and that, in fact, the whole issue of housing instability uh, itself was an important driver of poor health outcomes. Um, and part of what we're trying to do to Eli's circle of concern is really um, leverage both health and other institutions to, to widen the circle of concern just because housing affects so much. It affects not only health, it affects educational outcomes, it affects a gazillion things. And, and this is really about connecting the dots. So, you know, I would just open this up to, to funders to offer comments and, and, um, and maybe uh, share what things that they're thinking about. Um, and, and if I may, since I know that Susan and Jan and others are on the line, you know, if you would want to talk about what you see underway um, in the philanthropic community around the broad issue of uh, housing cost burden, I know, Susan, if you feel comfortable talking about that. I know this wasn't like necessarily um, planned for, but. Sure, you want me to jump in now? Sure. Yeah, it, what, what David is referring to is uh, a group of funders, eight and all, national funders who are looking at housing uh, really as that uh, connecting point to furthering non-housing outcomes. And so in the areas of health, like David mentioned, in the areas of education, income and income equality, equality or inequality, uh, economic mobility, and, 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 and it's an interesting mix of funders who um, are not traditionally all housing funders, um, <clears throat> but funders who have found themselves, as David, investing in housing because they realize the impact it has on their priority areas, in Kresge's case, uh, health. Um, and so we're looking at this, at what, what can philanthropy's role be in um, investing in policy levers that will further um, not only access to affordable housing for low-income and extremely low-income households, but also further those not have an impact on those those non-housing outcomes. Um, and what we found when we've looked at the data, and, and everyone had great data, I loved it. Um, what we found when we looked at the data was that underlying, and, and a couple of you mentioned this, especially Eli, was the issue of race and uh, inequality. And so how to layer that lens over this when we think about uh, interventions and uh, policies that we would, would support and align funding around. Great. Thanks. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and um, Yana, are you on the, on the line from uh, MacArthur? I am. Uh, I, I don't know if you wanted to sort of share maybe where MacArthur is. I know that the word is that MacArthur has been was going to get out of housing preservation, but um, how are you guys thinking about some of these issues now? Yeah, so I think we are. Um, you know, we we for a long time had a major investment in um, preserving affordable rental housing nationwide, and and certainly that is is and here in our hometown in Chicago, um, that has that has ended, but if there's, you know, this very clear, explicit connection to, to gentrification as it relates to preservation. Um, I would say, though, you know, our, where we are, you know, how, where we are still very active is um, in the sort of interconnectedness between housing and the whole range of issues that, David, you mentioned, including um, economic opportunity and um, where the research that we've invested in over the last several years is really demonstrating sort of the critical role that housing um, plays in both, um, you know, to this point of, uh, as a social determinant of health, um, as well as uh, in terms of access to opportunity. Um, there is so much to be lifted up and raised and real opportunities to start engaging people about investments in health and investments in education and investments in housing in tandem. And when you think about gentrification, it's not just a housing issue, though that's where it really manifests in terms of making sure that people are still included in 
um, the growth that's happening in a community, um, economic growth or otherwise, um, you know, population growth, it is, um, it is it's almost imperative that as people are making investments in schools or making investments in um, healthcare facilities and the relationship that healthcare facilities have to their neighborhoods, that, that housing is a, is a key part of that. And so I think the, um, the one thing that I've been thinking a lot about lately, and um, Nancy and I have talked about this, is so how do we think about investments in other areas that may facilitate gentrification? Um, you know, how does that, how do we think about those investments in transportation or um, active living spaces um, and what, how those sort of intersect as sort of investments in communities that have a positive health benefits, but men, they may have these other sort of effects in communities that may sort of help help push a community towards gentrification. Um, thinking of an example here in Chicago, where um, there was a major investment in um, an elevated rail line, converting it to a trail um, that is uh, sort of heavily used for biking and running and um, just overall recreational activity, but it is tremendously increasing property values along that trail line and pushing people out of communities. So how do we think about those investments as, you know, as we are thinking about those investments and starting those investments that we think about what are the implications for housing um, as we do that and um, the, the way that, that gentrification can be um, mitigated as we are making those investments. And these are public investments. These are non-housing investments, but public investments that are that are um, potentially, um, you know, can be harnessed in a way that also thinks about all the, the issues that the, the speakers talked about. So um, that's just kind of where we are. But making these connections and um, across the, the many investments that are made in communities in the role that they play and making sure that housing is not left out of that conversation. Yeah. Um, well, that, that's certainly, I think, a strong theme that uh, a lot of us are, you know, looking at this issue as, as Susan said, are, are are really thinking about how to how to build those connections. I know we only have a few minutes left, um, so I want to make sure that if there are any questions out there or comments from any other, um, you know, funders or other folks on the line uh, about what was said today, um, you know, feel free to kind of jump in. Um, you know, if if not, you know, I, I thought I would, you know, is uh, is Amy Kenyon from Ford um, on the line? Um, if not, I would just ask. Hello. Um, or anybody. Hello. She muted. Oh, she's not muted. Um, Okay. Um, so I don't know if, if, if or there's any other funders with any questions or would like to offer things that um, that they're doing in their area. Um, we just have a few minutes left. Um, if not, you know, I will uh, uh, turn it back to um, Nancy and your your staff. Thank you so much for pulling us all together. Uh, <laughs> And uh, David, I, this is Susan. I just, if no other funders have any um, their questions, I just have more kind of like a rhetor rhetorical question. Um, is that you know, I, in in thinking about what Yano is saying um, and what the panelists have been saying about uh, gentrification, is is how do we think about it, or how do we turn um, the impact of gentrification from from um, overwhelmingly negative to or or you know detrimental to low income and people of color as something positive and and I think Portland you know has tapped into something with this right to return preference um, or policies that can be put in place similar to that but you know gentrification when we think about communities of opportunity and creating opportunity for um, for um, uh, disinvested communities, you know that's really what happens when a neighborhood's gentrified. Um, but unfortunately, the unintended consequence um, is that people get pushed out. So, how to build that opportunity but allow people to stay? 
Right. Excellent point. Am I on mute? No. Okay. Well, um, this is Nancy. I just want to thank um, Lisa and Eli um, and Tanita for um, just super presentations, um, and thank David and um, others for jumping in and having some dialogue. That's what we're really hoping for. Um, I, I wanted to let you all uh, know as, um, as the moderator's prerogative that um, the, um, the Safe and Healthy Housing Coalition um, is having a webinar on June 7th from 1 to 2.30 p.m. That's Eastern Standard Time um, on the topic of healthy housing for older adults. Housing is a platform for community health systems. Um, I'll be speaking about a model that we developed in Vermont um, with a biostatistician from UVM who will speak about the um, health impacts and savings to Medicare from that program. And Howard Klink from Portland, Oregon will speak about um, a very similar model they have developed in the city of Portland with Amanda Saul from Enterprise Community Partners speaking about the benefits of health and housing to reducing Medicaid spending. So um, I, I hope that you all uh, can join us for that presentation. And um, again, um, thanks to the Kresge Foundation for your incredible support of this series and others. And um, have a great day. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank Bye. you.